But but I say that in terms of information arbitrage between a, a, a buyer and a seller. In terms of how to create value, that's a different question. You know what I mean? Like, how do, how do, how do I communicate value to a prospect? That's, you know, the entirety of persuasion and all that other stuff. But like, in terms of like, how, how do we pursue opportunities? Um, which is a subject that I'm gonna write a whole book about. Um, but like, opportunity itself, which is just like this big word that people like to throw around, but like, what is opportunity? How do you have a good opportunity versus bad opportunity? And so, um, the number one YouTube that I have, a video I have on my channel is, is I, I, I touch on the topic. Um, but I see it as three variables. So you have, uh, the total number of potential units to sell, which some people call TAM, right? Total adjustable market. But how many, how many units of this widget could I potentially sell? Number one. Number two is what is the value to uh, cost discrepancy? So how much profit can I potentially make solving this particular problem? And then number three is what are the competitive dynamics within that marketplace? So uh, an example that has two of the three would be like, what if I wanted to sell cell phone service? Lots of people need it. The, how much it costs me to add an additional customer is very, very low. So very high gross margins. But what are the competitive dynamics? Well, there's a lot of really entrenched players. It's very hard to get into that, right? And so when I'm looking at an opportunity, I wanna see all three. Now, the, the difficulty with using those three is that that equation can evolve over time. And so if you're starting a business right now, you might not have, you know, sell something that everyone in the world can buy, right? Actually, there's probably not many things that everyone in the world can buy. Um, I was talking to a, uh, they, they sold Kangen water. It's like a, it's like alkaline water. Yeah. And uh, you know, I was talking about their TAM and they're like, everybody, everybody drinks water. I was like, yeah, but no one's buying a $2,000 water machine. So the TAM isn't everybody. It's people who are foo-foo enough to buy $2,000 water machines, which is a much smaller, of the 7 billion people on earth where 80% of them don't have internet. I don't think your TAM is as big as you think it is. Right. And so, um, but as you get into business, you learn more. And then you realize that you can expand your market in one way or another. And I could get into how the different ways you can expand your market, but. Yeah, give us a little taste. Yeah, because yeah. So, I, I, the one thing I remember from maybe one of the things that you taught me was to think about uh, the scalability of things. Uh -huh. Yeah, 100%. And the scalability comes, uh, there's the entrepreneur component, which is like, you know, skills, traits, beliefs, which we can hit that if you want. Um, but then there's the scalability of the, of the deliverable, which is like, how do I create a del deliverable that is more scalable? When I, if you think about my trajectory, <clears throat> I first got in shape that, and I had a job, right? And then I uh, started selling fitness services because that was a skill that I learned. And then I got other people to do fitness services for me. So this is all levels of leverage. So like opportunity is just a fancy word for leverage. Um, and then after that, I sold licensing, which was with, with media, right? So my cost of incremental, uh, my incremental costs were basically zero, right? Every new customer was very low for me to, to, didn't cost me much to add them, right? Compared to how much money I could make from them. And so with the different business, you know, the different iterations of fundamentally the same skill set, I knew how to get people in shape. That was the skill set, right? I added in learning how to market, learning how to sell, and those were things that added value, right? And that was when we get into the, the entrepreneur skills, traits, beliefs, like that was from that side, but that is why I was able to climb the opportunity ladder and gain more leverage on the opportunity that I was pursuing. Um, and with regards to how do you in increase your, your total adjustable market, like, so there's four ways to increase it, there's five ways to adjust it. So um, the first four are the same, don't worry, the fifth one's just the last one. So you can go up market, which means you're selling to bigger versions of the same thing. So let's say I was helping hair salon owners. I could help people who have chains of hair salons, or I could help franchisors or licensors of hair salons. That'd be much, a much smaller demo, but they'd be much bigger clients, it'd be enterprise, right? I could go down market, which would be selling smaller versions, which would be like I could, I could sell hairstylists, Right? If I want to go down market from there, people who aspire to be hairstylists, right? So it's like a pyramid. Um, so you go up market, you can go down market. You can go adjacent market, which is what's similar to hairstylists that probably has similar wants and needs. So probably be like a lash salon or yeah, nail salon or something. Nail yeah. salon, yeah, exactly. So that would be an adjacent market. Um, or I could go broader. So broader is where you take all adjacent markets under one umbrella, which would be beauty. Right, so it'd be like, I help all beauty type brick and mortar businesses, right? That would be going broader. And so those are the four ways you can increase the total addressable market of whatever thing that you're serving. The fifth is you can go narrower. So I'd say that you can increase it four ways. The fifth is you go narrower, you get more, more specific about the constraints that you apply to the requisites to become a customer. The reason that most times with businesses that I take on in the portfolio, it's actually the first step we do is we actually narrow it most times. And it's because they, are, they don't even know who they serve and they don't know who they serve best. And so when you're starting out, one of the best practices you can do 
um, is uh, the fancy word is a common factor analysis, but basically what, is, what do all the best clients we have have in common? So if we take 100 clients and we look at the top 20%, because there's Pareto, they're probably responsible for 80% of the revenue anyways. We look at that 20%, we say, what do they all have in common? And then what if we only sold that amount of people and we sold now the same 100, but they were all of that 20%? Right. Well, we would 5X our revenue. Same operational drag, because it's the same size company but we're selling better customers. Yeah. And most people, you know, I, I get on with entrepreneurs all the time and they're like, I think I've saturated my market. And I'm like, all right, what's your, what are your, what's your revenue? They're like 2 million bucks a year. I'm like, okay. Well, <laughs> the market you're serving is a $60 billion industry and you are making $2 million a year. A little room to grow. Do you feel, yeah, I was like, do you feel like, it, like you might be premature or you just don't know how to get more customers? They're like, well, I guess I don't know how to get more customers. Like that's a problem that's solvable. So let's solve that. Right, and so then we can we can we can break down. There's a million ways to get customers, so I can break that down too if you yeah, want. Yeah, is, is, is there a certain type of business or industry that you gravitate to yeah, for the acquisition? And what is yeah, it? yeah. So we work with uh, business services, consumer services, ideally businesses that are e-learning, course. Like I love licensing models, so I love um, low overhead. Yeah, low high cash. Goods. Yeah, yeah, exactly. High and, margin. Yep. And the problems that those companies typically have, and we take them on usually between three and 10 million is when we, like in top line sales is when we start working with them. The problems that they usually have is that it's too founder led, it's too personality brand driven. They don't have enough customer lifetime value as in they sell something one time and they can't get people to keep buying, they can't get people to stick, they have high churn. Um, but they typically have high cash flow, but it's very dependent on usually one or maybe two channels of acquisition. And so we will kind of lay out our five-year plan to getting them from basically a company that has almost no value to getting to like 30 to 50, maybe $100 million in enterprise value. Um, and a company that has multiple acquisition streams, has an extended LTV. The LTV allows us to have all these different acquisition channels, but we, it depends on the, or, like the order in which we solve them depends on the business. Yeah. Uh, did you, what'd you have to pay for the domain acquisition.com? Was it expensive? Yeah, it was 400 grand. Oh yeah, not that bad actually. Yeah, I know. I looked at marketing.com, it was 5.6. Million. Okay. I yeah. thought about that. I told Layla, I sent her a proposal. I, I, I never email. I don't email. I don't check email. If anyone ever emails me, I, don't, I won't read it. So just letting you know. Um, and I literally sent a proposal. I was like, so I was thinking. Um, so I, I price anchored with marketing.com. And then I was like, we could also get acquisition.com, which is 400 grand. She was like, well, that seems much more reasonable because yeah. I anchored 5.6. But, that was smart. Um, but marketing.com, I still sometimes think about because uh, I do like that. I like that domain. But the thing is, is the reason I ended up doing acquisition wasn't even for the money. It was because the type of, of, of people and portfolio companies that I am looking for use the word acquisition. Mm -hmm. Like people who don't know business, not don't know, but like everyone knows what the word marketing means or thinks they know what the word marketing right. means. Right. It's a little bit more um, general. Right. People who are trying to scale their companies talk about cost of acquisition. And so it also had the double entendre of we, you know, acquire minority, you know, uh, stakes in the companies in addition to helping with acquisition. Yeah. So I kind of like that component too. Yeah, 400 grand. I mean, it seems like a steal because yeah. I think I was like five or six years ago, Zuckerberg bought FB.com for like $8 million or something like that. Great deal. Just like probably also a great deal yeah. in, in retrospect. Yeah. yeah.